message of grace is brought to you by Christian people who believe the Bible to be the Word of God and who appreciate its power and authority. Within the pages of the Bible itself, there is a God-given design for its study. Rightly dividing the Word of Truth is the key to understanding the Bible. We're glad you've joined us for another interesting look into God's infallible book as Richard Jordan, president of Grace School of the Bible, presents another in a series of messages designed to help you understand and enjoy the Bible. Let's join them now. We're certainly glad you've joined us today. We're going to go back to Romans chapter number 15 today and uh, try to answer a, a question that uh, sometimes folks never ask. You know, on this program often we ask, we ask questions that people don't ask and we answer questions that people don't ever think of. And a lot of times that's because they've never gotten to think very deeply or, or thoughtfully about God's Word. You know, we live in a busy day. And people go hustling and bustling around and so forth. And the Bible says you need to bring every thought in captivity to the obedience of Christ. And unfortunately, people today generally, Christian people even, are not, uh, not real Bible students. I remember, I remember a lady years ago when I was only a young believer. Uh, we were talking about the Word of God. And she says, oh, Brother Jordan, I don't have time to study the Bible. I'm too busy serving the Lord. And I've always remembered that lady because uh, she always seemed to be busy, like, you know, Martha, uh, cumbered and hurried and busy with a lot of things. But that one thing that was needful, uh, she didn't have. I had another friend at that time, uh, another lady. Uh, I was a, just a, you know, 15, 16-year-old young lad. I was saved when I was 15. And there was, a, there was another saint in the assembly there that I attended in those early days, and, and she was a great student of the Word of God. In fact, she was uh, taught in the, in, the, in the Sunday school and was a great friend. Her and her husband were, were great uh, students of the Bible. And they used to listen to M.R. DeHaan on the radio and get the little study books and then pass them on to me. And I can remember spending hours and hours of, of, of study with these, this, this couple as they would instruct me in the Word of God and teach me things. And I remember how hungry it always made me and how much more fruitful service was, serving the Lord was, when you, when you did it from a basis of, boy, just the overflow of what you learn. And that particular lady that said she was too busy to study the Bible, she was too busy serving God, you know, her tank ran dry, and before long she quit. Because it wasn't life springing out of her. It was just busyness. And you get, there's a barrenness in busyness. And that's, that's the Mary and Martha syndrome. And when Martha was all cumbered, you know, she came out and fussing at Mary because, or fussing at the Lord because Mary was just sitting at his feet listening to his word. And the Lord kindly but forcefully told her, you know, that one thing that's needful, Mary chose. That was sitting there at the word of God. The Christian life is a life of Jesus Christ living in us. Uh, it's a life he lives through us. You'll never be able to live it on your own. It's lived in the power of the Spirit of God. But the Spirit of God doesn't work apart from the Word of God. And the Word of God doesn't work apart from the Spirit of God. And it's as you understand God's Word that the, word, that, that the life of Jesus Christ is liberated. As you by faith take your stand in the Word of God, it's your faith in the facts and the truths of your identity in Christ that, that set those truths free in your life to bring forth fruit uh, for the glory of God. So we don't make any apology about having a Bible study program. We're not singing and we're not dancing and we're not having a hoot nanny here. What we're doing is we're trying to study God's Word. And we're looking for people just like you that want to know something about the Word of God in truth and, and share it with you. I'm glad that there are people right where in your community that put this program on your, your, your uh, television station uh, where you are, that are concerned that truth be proclaimed in your, in your community. Uh, all over, the, all, all over uh, your area. And uh, I'm glad for that. And I'm glad to be partners together with them. And there's something here in Romans 15 that Paul talks about when he talks about the scope and purpose of his ministry that is, that is of vital importance. Understanding the, the scope and the purpose of Paul's ministry is vital to understanding the uniqueness about what God is doing today in my life and in the life of every other believer. What God will do in your life if you're not a believer. So let's look at this passage today. This, this last part of Romans 15 is often overlooked. It's kind of 
kind of weird stuff in a way. And, you know, when you're looking for devotional stuff and little ditties, this isn't exactly where you usually go. And yet there's some tremendously important information here. And you'll find that as you, you, you study it, that it'll, it, it, it will, as we go through it, it will bear uh, some real fruit in your understanding. Romans 15, verse 16, Paul talks, begins to talk about the scope of his ministry, how broad it is. Uh, Romans 15, verse 16, he says that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. Now we've talked about how the Lord Jesus Christ in His earthly ministry was a minister to, minister to the nation Israel. Uh, for the truth came and confirmed the promises on, uh, of the, uh, that were made unto the fathers. And uh, that later on, the Lord Jesus Christ from heaven's glory chose that other apostle, the apostle Paul, and sent him out to the Gentiles. And when he sent Christ, Christ sent Paul to the Gentiles, he sent him with a, with, with a scope of ministry that was an every man ministry. That I should minister the, be, the, be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, that the, that, the, uh, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. I have therefore... Uh, whereof I may glory through Jesus Christ in those things that pertain to God. For I have not dared, I, I, I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ hath not wrought by me to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed through mighty signs and, and, and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God so that from Jerusalem and round about unto Iliacrum I have fully preached the gospel of Christ." Verse 21, he says, But as it is written, to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see. They that have not heard shall understand. For which cause also I have been much hindered from coming to you. I mean, when he says it from Jerusalem all the way around to Iliacrum, that he's preached, fully preached the gospel, that covers the whole of the northern Mediterranean area. That covers... Paul had carried the gospel to the known world, the accessible world of his day in, in the area where he was. In fact, if you go on down in this chapter, you'll see that he's not only wanting to come to them at Rome, but he's also got plans to go on. Verse 28 says, when therefore I, am, uh, I, uh, I have performed this, that, talking about going to Jerusalem, and have sealed to them this fruit, I will come by you into Spain. <laughs> I mean, this guy's he's, he's covered the whole of the, of the western Mediterranean, northwestern Mediterranean, Turkey and Greece and Macedonia, and, and, and he's going to go to Italy. And then he wants to go on from there all, all the way out to the end of the Mediterranean to Spain. Uh, Paul has a ministry, the scope of which is the world. In fact, if you go over to Colossians chapter number, uh, chapter number 1, in describing his, his, his preaching ministry, he says in Colossians 1, 23, If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard, which was preached, listen now, to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. That's why in Acts chapter 17, as early as Acts 17, not well at the end of the book of Acts, but as early as Acts 17, the uh, book of Romans was written in the first three verses of Acts 20. Right in the midst of Paul's ministry, he's at Thessalonica, and people, the, the stir comes, people get saved, and, 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 and the community gets in an uproar about people getting saved. And they, they grab them and they carry them down to the magistrates and they say, the men who have turned the world upside down have come hither also. <laughs> I mean, imagine having that reputation. The guy had gotten around. I mean, he was truly taking the gospel to the Gentiles, to the whole world, to every creature. Now, I don't know if you notice that verse, but when he says, which was pre the gospel which is preached to every creature which is under heaven, it's significant that it's Paul that preached the gospel to every creature which is under heaven. It's significant that it was during the time when Paul was taking the gospel to the Gentiles, the twelve apostles were remaining at Jerusalem. They stayed at Jerusalem. In fact, in Acts 15, when you go there, of course, you, you know, James is dead by then, but there are only 11 of them left, but they're all there in Jerusalem. Uh, when Peter leaves Jerusalem and goes to Antioch where the Gentiles are, and you know what happens to him. You remember that? Galatians 2. He gets in trouble. 
And Paul has to withstand him. And, and then people come from James. And there's a big, and there's a big schism. Taste. When the 12 apostles, when, when, when the, the earthly apostles of the Lord get out among the Gentiles, there's a mess. There's trouble. Their problems develop. And yet, when Paul's out there, the, God, the offering up of the Gentiles is acceptable. And when he says, the gospel has been preached to every creature which is under heaven, it's real significant that it's Paul that's preaching the gospel to every creature which, which is under heaven. Do you remember the commission that the Lord Jesus Christ gave the twelve? Well, there were only eleven of them because Judas was dead and Matthias hadn't been uh, ordained to the ministry yet. But the, the commission that he gave to them in Mark 16, he said, he, he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to who? Every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Now, that's the gospel of the kingdom. And that's the gospel that they preached. And, and they, were to, they were given a commission to take their gospel to the, to the Gentiles, to every creature. Acts chapter 1, the Lord Jesus Christ told them, you, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you'll be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Let me tell you something. Jerusalem is in Palestine. Now, I know, what, I know what the preachers tell you. They say, well, Jerusalem, that's your hometown. That is heresy. You look up any map, and Jerusalem isn't where you live if you live in the United States. Jerusalem is in the Middle East. Jerusalem is in Palestine. Judea, you know where that's at? That's in Palestine. Samaria, you know where that's at? It's in Palestine. It's not the United States. And the preacher that tells you that it is is a preacher that doesn't believe the words on the page in the Bible mean what they say. He's a modernist. You say, oh, no, my preacher's a fundamentalist. He's a Bible believer. Not if he says, tells you Jerusalem's your hometown. Because if you took the apostles that were standing there in Acts chapter 1, verse 8 that he's talking to, Jerusalem was not their hometown, by the way. They were from Galilee. Oh, get out a map and read it. <laughs> get out a map and look at it sometime. They weren't from Jerusalem. That wasn't their home. Jerusalem is the city of the great king, Matthew 5, 35. It's the Messiah's hometown. And it had to be saved first, according to Zechariah chapter 12. Oh, yeah, that's why, see, they start at Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. They get all, all of Israel saved. Christ had told them, you'll not go, be going over the cities of Israel until the Son of Man be come. And then just what Psalm chapter 2, verse 6 to 8 says, God the Father says to His Son, He says, I'll set my Son on my holy hill of Zion, and I'll give the decree. Ask of me, and I'll give you the heathen for an inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for a possession. So Christ says, go. Preach to Jerusalem, Judea. Get Israel saved, and get them converted, and get them redeemed, and I'll come back. And in the kingdom will go out to the uttermost parts of the world. The apostles were sent to the uttermost part of the world. They were sent to the Gentiles. It's significant that they never got there. They never gathered that waiting harvest. Paul's statement concerning the scope of his ministry is important because it shows that there's, there's been a change taking place in the program of God. A new apostle, Paul, has been the one who's been raised up to go do the work among the Gentiles, not the twelve. Well, you say, well, why is that? Well, if you look there in Romans 15 and finish that passage, the purpose of Paul's ministry Marks a distinct change in God's program. Verse 20, he says, Romans 15, 20, Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. Paul's determined that he would preach only where Christ was not named, so that he would not build on another man's foundation. Now that's, that's, that's a problem. Because the, the opposite of that is the way he tells us to function. 1 Corinthians chapter um, 3. Find the passage here. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 10. Paul says, According to the grace of God which is given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. 
Let every man take heed how he builds thereon. Paul expected you and me to build on the foundation that he laid. The time's going to get away. We're not going to have time to look at all these verses, but Ephesians chapter 2, the last uh, verse 19 to 22, 2 Timothy 2, Paul says uh, that, that the things which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who should be able to teach others also. Paul laid the foundation. Timothy's to build on that foundation, and he's to teach others to build on that foundation. That's the way we do the ministry. The body of Christ is to be uh, constantly building on the work and the dedication of, of those who've gone before it. The foundation is laid before it. What did Paul mean then when he, when he refused to build on something that had gone before him? Well, he says he... Strive to preach where Christ was not, not where Christ was named, lest he should build another man's foundation. Where was Christ named? Why, the Lord Jesus Christ was named up there among the apostles, was he not? He was named uh, among the believing remnant of Israel, the little flock. In fact, in Acts chapter 4, Peter very clearly and, and, and very boldly says to the, uh, uh, the, the, the leaders of his nation, this Talking about the Lord Jesus Christ is the stone which the build, which is set at naught of the builders, uh, which has become the, the, the head of the corner. He's the foundation. He's the chief cornerstone, the one who is the foundation stone, the key element. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby you must be saved, whereby we must be saved, the nation, the group. You, you see, Christ was named among the little flock. And Peter, Paul says, I'm not going to build on another man. I'm not going to go over there and build on the foundation that Peter laid, the rock that he laid down, the, the preaching of Jesus Christ in, in Peter's program. The kingdom church was built on the foundation laid by the apostles. That Jesus Christ was the Messiah, the Son of the living God. That He was, that he was the one uh, who would be Israel's King and Israel's Redeemer and Israel's Messiah. He was the Son of the living God. That's what Christ had told Peter. Uh, go back with me to Matthew chapter 16. I get one, another one of these passages that, boy, when you just read it, it's a blessing. But if you listen to religion, you know, you get, whew, what is that? Uh, Matthew 16, verse 15. Uh, Jesus says unto his disciples, Whom say ye that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus, an Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I, and I say unto thee, I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter. God the Father had revealed something to Peter. God the Father had revealed to Peter that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, that He was the Messiah of Israel. Jesus says, I also say unto you, unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What church are we talking about? And I will give unto thee the keys of the, the kingdom. The kingdom church. No question about it. The kingdom church. And it's going to be built on this rock. Now, I know somebody will come along and say, well, that rock is Peter. But, you know, if you go to 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter would tell you he's not the rock. Christ is the rock. We just read the passage in Acts 4 where, where he talks about Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, Paul says, Christ is that rock. Deuteronomy chapter 32 says, Their rock, talking about apostate Israel, hooked up with Baal worship and the religious system, their rock is not our rock. The rock that begat Israel is who we're talking about. We're not talking about Peter. We're talking about the confession that Peter just made about Christ. Nothing built on Peter is ever going to be any better than what something would have been built on you. Uh, if, it was built, if, if, you, if you're part of a church built on Peter, look at the problem you got down in verse number uh, 22. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. And he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Ooh. <laughs> 
Folks, if a church is built on Peter, it would have been a church built on Satan. No, it isn't Peter that the church is built on. This kingdom church is going to be built on Christ as Peter preached him. The foundation, the doctrine about Christ that Peter laid, that he's the Messiah. Jesus Christ is named out there among that believing remnant as Israel's Messiah. Paul said, I'm not going to preach the gospel that's committed to me. I'm not going to continue building that foundation. I'm going to go over here and lay another foundation. And I'm going to build over here on this foundation over here. This foundation laid by Peter about Christ being the Messiah, Israel's king, kingdom. This ministry over here having to do with the, the church, the body of Christ, having to do with the program of, of the Lord Jesus Christ be, being, uh, being the one who provides salvation by the grace of God. This program over here is the prophetic program, the foundation that, that, that's the foundation of prophecy. This one in here is the, is the, the, the subject of the mystery. Paul says, as a wise master builder, I've laid the foundation. What is that foundation? Other foundation can no man lay? Then that is Jesus Christ. Others come along and build. On the, Paul understood that others weren't going to lay the foundation. He understood that my job, your job, isn't to lay the foundation again. That was his job. Just like Peter laid that one, he, Paul laid this one. We build on the foundation that Paul laid. And he says he wasn't going to preach where Christ was named. Lest he'd build, he wasn't going to continue building this foundation. He's going to start building on a brand new foundation that he laid down that was revealed to him by Christ from heaven and he wasn't going to go out and preach on that foundation which had been previously established. If you go with me to Ephesians chapter number 2, verse 19, Paul says, Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, talking about these folks over here. We're no longer outside the family and can't get in the house. We're no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being, he's, he's the foundation. He's the foundation. The house, we're part of the household now. Not a household that we're, we weren't part of that one. We didn't get in. We were outside. The wall kept us out, the middle wall of partition. But God's added a, a grace wing. <laughs> There's a new wing on the house. There's a new addition over here. And Paul laid the foundation for it. And he said, I'm not going to go and build on that foundation. I'm not going to go over there and build on that foundation. Because if I do, what's going to happen is I'm going to mix things that God has made different. Now you and I need to understand where we are in the program of God. And not to take... What, what God has separated and excluded and made different and try to make them the same. You go back over here and try to build on the foundation laid down in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the early uh, Acts period or in the books of Hebrews through Revelation. You try to build on that, on that foundation and you're going to bring absolute confusion and heartache and, and, and wreck. you'll be building on quicksand that will not support your life in Christ. You can't make God do something He isn't doing today. You go back over here and try to build your, your, your life on Genesis to Malachi and take the program that God has in effect back there and act like it's what He's doing now in your life. And you go back over there and you get Israel's tithe and Israel's water and Israel's holy days and Israel's ceremonies and Israel's gospel and Israel's, Israel's prayer promises and all the rest. And you try to put them on what you're doing and you're building on another man's foundation and it'll bring wreck and ruin. When the, when the storm blows and the wind howls and the rain hits, it's going, you're going to be swept away. But you come over here and build on the foundation that Paul laid for you. That Christ, through Paul, laid down in His Word for you to be established on. 
You need to have the same dedication and determination Paul did. Not to build on another man's foundation. Build on the foundation God gave you and me to stand on. Now, when, uh, uh, when Paul's ministry is understood, the scope of it and the purpose of it, the purpose of Paul's ministry is to lay a new foundation, not the old one, a new one. And then the scope of it is to take that new gospel of the grace of God out to every man, woman, boy, and girl, and proclaim the good news of God's grace through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ into every hamlet and in every corner and to every creature. And it's important that you and I realize that with, with the ministry that, 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 that was given to the Apostle Paul, a brand new program began. With Paul, start, God started a brand new vehicle of reconciliation and sent that vehicle out to a lost and dying world. And our function is to do just what Paul did here, to strive to preach the gospel to every creature under heaven and to be sure that everyone we know knows the wonderful truth that Christ died for our sins, that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day, and that the gospel of Christ is the power of God to everyone that believes, to everyone that will rest completely and fully and confidently in what He's done for them at Calvary. That ought to be the thing that consumes and controls your life in order to use your life in a way that glorifies and honors God. We're glad you listened today, and we're glad you've been with us. Tune in again next time. We'll just take up here again and go on in Romans 15. Until then, Maranatha. <clears throat>